Oh, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Joan Kerber Walker, and this is the first edition of AZ Bio Peers for 2022. So, congratulations to Natalie on her first very successful year as coordinator of this program. And now, um, let's get started. So today we're going to be talking about um, the building blocks that are crucial for your company's startup considerations. And we are thrilled to have with us Helen Goldstein. Helen is an associate um, at Perkins Coie in the firm's corporate group and maintains a general cross-industry practice that has um, been working with highly regulated or intellectually property rich environments, i.e. life sciences, um, for, for a number of years. Helen brings efficient leadership to key parts of the transaction process and along with her own knowledge, understands how to effectively leverage and experience all of the practice groups within the firm. Um, you know, there's a, a general balance between the big story and the small nuance, and she is great at providing clients with that insightful, comprehensive perspective on the transactions that they need to navigate. Um, Helen has a reputation for building creative transactional structures, prioritizes the collaborative approach, and drives her clients' agendas forward efficiently and effectively. She also maintains a pro bono practice representing children from marginalized communities as they navigate all aspects of the public school system here in Arizona. Welcome, Helen. We're thrilled to have you with us today. Thank you so much for having me. And with that, I'm going to pop off, and the, the show is yours. Awesome. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the morning show with Helen Goldstein. I'm, I'm going to give you a minute to, like, tune into my accent. It's 100% real. I'm originally from England, um, and now I practice corporate law here in America. I'm, I'm a corporate attorney, which, is, which means that I never go to court. And the way that I try and explain what I do on a daily basis is that I am a very specialized type of author, that I write relationships, whether that be a writing a company that controls the relationships with people who expect to be together for a while, or writing a contract, which can be a very short term thing. I agree to sell you X, you agree to give me money for it or a more long-term relationship, like a clinical trial agreement, for example. I love my job because I am in a position to make sure that there are really never any losers. No one will ever get 100% of what they want, but in general, I'm able to bring people to the table, people then sit at my table, and then people exit my table, hopefully, better off than they came to the table. So I just very passionate about what I do. So I wanted to give you a brief overview of what we're gonna to cover today. Um, I, I try to fit in as much life sciences theming as possible. So if you, every time you spot like my life sciences theme, you know, you can give me a tick for that. Um, the first thing I wanna cover is like the anatomy of your company. What are the key documents that you need in your company and what's the mechanics of those documents? The second thing we're gonna cover is your company behaviors. How, how does a company really act? I mean, a company is really a theoretical concept. Like how, how does it really perform in the real world? The third thing we're gonna talk about is company ownership by resource providers. I'm kind of gonna give you a, a big concept of how I think that it should work. And then, I'm, and then give you some ideas of who connects into that. Is it founders, providers, finance, providers of services? There's lots of different ways in which that can play in. The next idea we're gonna talk about is company growth. So there is a way in which a company develops, and it's not just by hiring more people. In this instance, we're going to talk about really the nuts and bolts of what are you growing in your company? And for life sciences companies, that's almost always IP. 
So acquiring, deploying, managing, protecting your IP. And the last thing I want to do is kind of leave you with a dose of healthy corporate practices. You know, when someone sits and says, here are some healthy lifestyle tips for you. Um, so we're going to go through a few of what I think are really healthy corporate practices. If you have any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat box. Um, if I see something which is like particularly pertinent to what I'm talking about, I'll deal with it then. Otherwise, we're going to try and leave about 10 minutes at the end to questions. Okay, so let's talk about what's kind of considered the constitution of your corporation. This is a certificate of corporation. Depending on what state you're in, sometimes it's called something different, but you'll hear it referred to as your charter. You might hear it referred to as your COI, your certificate of incorporation. Uh, people love to use like all of these little words and cool things, different things, you know, just, just to make them sound a little smarter. If someone ever says to you, oh, can I see your COI? Just be, and you don't know what that is, just say, what is that? You know, what, what would you like to see? Make them spell it out. Don't ever let anyone make you feel like you don't know what you're doing. You know, just, just say to them, hey, sorry, what are you looking for? So your COI is your senior governing document. And these provisions supersede all other documents. Therefore, this is the first time I'm going to tell you a theme which we're going to continue throughout, which is do not get creative here. Do not get creative in your COI. There are forms, COIs, fill them out, try and keep as standard as possible. No action of your company can violate your COI. You can try, and maybe for a while you'll get away with it, but every so often you'll get an investor who comes along, wants to give something to your business, takes a look at your COI and says, hang on, how did you do that? Oh, you didn't really do that because you couldn't, because your COI, it, that, that's it. That's as far as you can go. Just like, unfortunately, humans cannot now self-fly without airplanes, your company cannot do anything that, does, that it does not have in its COI. Due to this kind of very superior and fundamental nature, the investors will bake in their preferences, their protections, and any other rules that they want into this document because it doesn't really matter what else you do contractually, they feel like they are going to put their protections, be that I have to consent to you uh, taking out a certain level of debt, their preferences um, on any distribution I'm gonna get first, that's where they're going to put them. In every single funding round, therefore, this is one of the key documents that gets amended and restated. So in your seed round, you will have an amended and restated certificate of corporation that you put in place. Your series A, a, reset, a second amended and restated certificate of incorporation. I wanted to answer one question which I certainly had when I moved to America, which was why are you guys so obsessed with Delaware? Like, I'm sure it's a very, very cute place, but you know, Arizona is great too. Why don't, we, why don't we incorporate our companies here in Arizona? The reason why Delaware is that Delaware has created almost a monopoly on corporate law. They have, um, they have a very developed commercial corporate body of their judicial system, which really only handles corporate disputes. There is a lot of certainty in Delaware. In general, we know what's going to happen and the law is predictable and everyone, no one likes litigating, but if you're going to litigate in general, people like litigating in Delaware. It's possibly a bit cheaper, it's quicker, and the rules are just a lot more certain just because so many cases have gone through the Delaware courts now. So that's why in general, if you're incorporating, Delaware is always your best option. So let's talk about the different types of legal persons that there are out there. The first type of legal person is you. You are a real person, but you're also in and of yourself a legal person. You are one person 
with an idea. And before you have, before at that moment at which you have that brainwave at the bench and you have that aha moment and it's in your head, you are a sole proprietorship. It, it is you. And so anyone who is contracting with about that brainwave idea that you just had, they are contracting with you in your personal capacity. Let's say it's you and your research assistant who come up with this great idea together. You are actually a general partnership, two or more people with an idea. And the bar for creating a general partnership is incredibly low. As soon as you are working together with someone else, you will be considered a general partnership. Because of that, as soon as there are more than just one person involved, as soon as it is out of your head and you are working with another person, that is the point at which you need to start discussing okay, wh what is our relationship here. They might be your employee. They might be, you might decide that you are going to form a partnership. But what you want to do is make sure that everyone is clear because the work, if you set expectations early, you have that discussion early, then you are not going to have the argument down the line. The next type of kind of species of corporation, of, of entity that I have is a limited liability partnership. This is something that says LP, LLP, or LLC. All three of these things are limited liability partnerships. They are creations of statute, i.e. Arizona, Delaware, whatever state you're in, allows you to create them. LP stands for limited partnership. LLP, limited liability partnership. LLC, limited liability company. Do not get confused. An LLC is still in the eyes of the law and tax a generally a partnership. This is one or more people who have a great idea and decide to create their own legal person in order to hold that idea. That is your that is your limited liability partnership. You've actually taken the next step. And you have formed a legal person to hold that. The next type of entity is a corporation. This is, again, one or more, one or more people who have an idea and form this type of legal person to hold an idea. Corporations are taxed differently, they're seen differently. And for investors, investors usually expect to see corporations rather than LLCs. That may change in the future, but in general, we see most of the time that when an investor comes along, if you are an LLC, they will want you to convert to a corp. The key difference between an LLC and a corp is its tax treatment. And that is absolutely beyond what we're going to talk about today. I, I know about as much about tax as I need in order to be dangerous. I generally listen to people, think that's interesting, and then call my colleagues who are fully awesome tax attorneys. I, I really try not to handle that myself. We talked about Delaware briefly. So the preferred species, as I said, is a corporation and the preferred habitat is Delaware. Um, sole proprietorships and general partnerships are not their own legal persons. That's a great question, Julia. So a sole proprietorship is just a different way of saying you in your personal capacity. You in your personal capacity had an idea and every time you're contracting about that idea, someone is contracting with you personally. In a general partnership, a general partnership is is also not the same type of legal entity, legal person as a limited liability partnership. In a, in a general partnership, it's much more informal. You don't need to file and create a general partnership, but when the law looks at you, they will look at you with the rules of they formed a general partnership together. You have, for example, fiduciary duties to your, gen to your other partner, which means that 
you can't um you won't be able to exploit the idea by yourself and take all the profits without involving them with it the concern with a general partnership is that it's just so informal that and and people haven't laid down the 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 rules and haven't set legal haven't set written expectations that it becomes very tricky to manage bylaws i used to think that bylaws were like a real really big deal but i've come to realize that really bylaws are in my practice something which doesn't even get restated with with each financing your bylaws do a few things firstly they define the constituents of your corporation so by constituents i mean your shareholders your directors your officers your committees almost like you know like your body has organs so the different organs of your of your corporation they also determine how each constituency operates and in general, these are very standard documents. They are rarely amended because all of the important protective provisions are included in the COI, the charter, rather than the bylaws. So in general, you will find that bylaws are incredibly boring standard documents. And again, if you get creative, you will cause yourself problems. So just don't do it. There are a few other controlling agreements that we see now. And those controlling agreements, whenever you are involved in fundraising or venture capital, mostly we now have a set of form agreements that everyone uses. So let's talk about those types. And then I'll kind of give you like the practical perspective of what's happening here. The first type of controlling agreement you could have is just generally a shareholders agreement which can be an agreement between your shareholders that can be related to almost anything that the shareholders vote on. Generally, I have seen entities have these at an early stage if they wanna make sure that certain people are directors, for example. Um, in general, as soon as an investor, gets in, an, inv an investor gets involved, they will be terminated. So you can spend the time writing them if, if there's something crucial that you need to make sure happens at an early stage between founders. But in general, those general shareholders holders agreements are going to drop out pretty quickly. The next one is right to first refusal and co-sale agreements. So a right of first refusal does exactly what it says on 10. It is an agreement that if stock is sold, it is offered first to the corporation or to existing shareholders. So if someone wants to leave the company and sell their stock, you, you don't want to bring in, you don't want them to be picking who you're going to have to be involved with, particularly if this person is a significant shareholder. Um, they want to sell their shares. You, you want to have some control over that. So in general, we have a rights of first refusal, which usually goes first to the corporation. So the corporation can buy back its own stock and all of the shareholders will then get less diluted. And that's how their ownership will increase. Alternatively, then you can start offering it to ex existing shareholders. Each shareholder generally has what's called a pro rata right to purchase it. So if you have a 50% interest in the company, you are going to be able to buy 50% of whatever's on offer. So if you have 50% interest in the company, 20% is on offer, you will be able to purchase just your half of what's on offer. A co-sale agreement is otherwise called a tag-along. There are tag-alongs and drag-alongs. A tag along is the following. One of your founders just got a fantastic offer to buy his stock in the, in the entity. It's great. And you look at him green with envy that he is just about to make a massive profit on his stock. And then you say, ho ho, but Helen for the tag along right in our controlling agreement. So I get to tag along with your sale. So if you are selling your stock, I have, I, I have the right to exactly the same terms. So you're selling your stock to an investor. 
then that investor is also going to have to make the same offer to me. And if it won't, then no deal. You then have a voting agreement. This is my number three bullet here. A voting agreement usually contains two things. The first will be that the shareholders agree to vote for a certain state of directors. The other thing it has is a drag along, which is the which is connected to a tag along. A drag along is I am the minor, my majority shareholder. I just found a fantastic buyer for my company. But I have all these little shareholders who might have 3%, 5%, 2%, right? I don't want it to be that any single one of those very small shareholders can hold up my deal. So when they signed the voting agreement, they agreed that I could drag them along to, the, to my deal, okay? The last kind of standard document we usually have now are indemnification agreements. And this is an agreement that the corporation will indemnify its directors and officers for acts that they do in service of a company. Indemnification means that I, if you are, if you are hurt in, if you are financially hurt in some way and you were acting in good faith for the company, then the company is going to cover your costs if you are sued. Um, you're, this is probably a concept that's fairly, fairly familiar to you in the life sciences industry because those suits can be incredibly expensive when it comes to, for example, patients coming back. A company is born through filing their COI, an action of an incorporator, an organizational board consent. The board, can, the board gets together and says, yes, this is what we want to do and how we want to do it an organizational stockholder consent, which is the stockholders, shareholders, same thing, getting together and saying, yep, this is what we want to do. And then a grant to the founders of however you're going to split it up. And these things happen simultaneously. Don't miss out those two board consents. Otherwise, you have to pay someone like me a lot of money during your seed rounds to write them for you in very tortured language of this is what happened back then. You know, back then, this is what we agreed. It's much easier just to get it done up front. OK, let's turn to company behaviors. As I said before, there are three general constituencies of a company. You have your shareholders, your directors, and your officers. And here I'm talking about a corporation, not an LLC. Um, in an LLC, by the way, your shareholders are usually called members. Directors is like, is like a manager, but both of them have officers. But we're going to try and focus and kind of keep, keep going on our corporation, our Delaware corporation road. So shareholders, directors, officers, three constituencies. Shareholders, how do shareholders act? Shareholders act through resolutions, usually made during an annual meeting, a special meeting, or what happens most often is through written consents. If I want to get something done, if one of my clients wants to get something done in their corporation, they don't want to have to call and call a special meeting, have everyone jump on the phone and do that. What I can do is I can draft them a simple written consent that they can send out to all of their shareholders. Their shareholders can docu-sign it and send it back. The next type of constituency is a director. Directors make resolutions. Again, they are made during regular meetings. Regular meetings happen, for example, quarterly special meetings, or again, directors can act by written consent. Lastly, officers, officers act pursuant to authority that is granted to them by the directors and officers are, are human beings. So they don't have an issue with having to pass resolutions. Your CEO doesn't have to sit down and go, I resolve to. Your CEO can, within the limits of the authority that's been granted to him, act. The last constituency that you may or may not have in your company are committees and advisory boards. So common committees that we see are compensation and audit committees. These usually come along a little bit later in the life cycle of a company, um, just simply because at the beginning, you'll see those decisions generally being made by the board. Um, the other committee or, or board 
that you're maybe likely to have a scientific advisory board where you find often prominent individuals to sit on your staff and um and advise you um, be a person that you can call and certainly someone who you can hold out to investors and say, look, he's on my staff. Shareholders, I, you, I'm sure you've seen these like very cute little uh, vintage shareholder certificates. Now I promise you that, that they're not as pretty anymore, which I think is very sad. And also in general, they're not always a necessity anymore. You can actually do stock that is uncertified uncertificated and uh, administratively it makes things a lot easier but then again you have nothing to hang on your wall shares and stock mean exactly the same thing shareholders stockholders mean exactly the same thing the coi provides you with a number of authorized stock my company can um my company has a hundred common shares of authorized stock that is the that is how much the company, the corporation is authorized to issue. And but it stays in that kind of authorized bucket. When it's granted or sold to a stockholder, it now becomes issued. So you can have a hundred shares of common stock that are authorized and 50 shares of common stock that are issued to Joan. I'm gonna pick you, Joan. Joe and I formed a company. It has a hundred. It has um. It has a hundred, um, a hundred shares of authorized stock, and I issue you fifty of those shares. Joan is a hundred percent owner of my company. She's not fifty percent owner of my company, right? That she owns all of the issued shares. So when we are talking about ownership of our company. I don't really like what's in the bucket isn't how I determine who owns my company. My company is determined by who has issued stock. The names and numbers of the people who hold that stock are listed in what we call a capitalization table or for short a cap table. And there are some really great new online management tools for cap tables like Carter. They become essential, I would say, at the point at which you've done a seed round. A seed round for sure a series A. I think these kind of tools become essential for transparency and for and for management. Before that point, I see absolutely nothing wrong with a really well-maintained Excel spreadsheet. But please do maintain that because you don't want that argument with one of your shareholders the day that you are exiting when you are selling your company and it's life-changing idea for three billion dollars you do not want to have an argument over whether that person owns three percent or five percent not worth it if it all it is is as easy as just keeping great records in an excel spreadsheet and then later something like carter there are different classes of shares in general you will find that founders get common shares Common shares are often what we call restricted because they vest over time. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this later. Service providers will also usually get restricted common stock with similar vesting requirements. Investors usually get preferred stock. So preferred stock comes with certain, as you would think, preferences. And do you remember where those are baked in? Those preferences are baked into your COI. So your COI, your charter will say, authorized 100 common stock and 100 preferred. So a series seed will get series seed preferred. A series A will get series A preferred. And guess what a series B will get? We are highly unimaginative. And again, do not get creative. Call them series B preferred stock. There are certain actions that must be approved by a shareholder. This is not an exhaustive list, but these are these are kind of key things that I want you to think about when you are messing with your company in a fundamental way. You need to think about who needs to consent to this. In general, if you are amending your charter, your shareholders 
have to consent to that. If you are undertaking anything that is a fundamental corporate transaction, a merger, a sale of the company, or a sale of substantially all of the assets of the company, even if you're just keeping the shell, those are things that you need to check in with your shareholders on. Any rights that shareholders have in, their, in the charter they will bake in certain requirements. And I've certainly seen investors say, if you're taking out a certain amount of debt, you need to check in with us and we need to consent to that. Um, it might be changes in your board of directors that they're going to want to consent to. So just always keep an idea and think about it. When you are granting an investor certain rights and it's like, oh, that's an easy one. Oh, I don't mind if we give them a consent right over contracts $50,000 or more, just think about it for a minute, because that means that every time you want to sign one of those contracts, they essentially have a veto right over that. And in a clinical trial, how quickly do you get to a contract that has a value of $50,000? I would say generally very quickly. So you don't want to grant someone accidentally too much control over your business by giving certain shareholders consent rights. Here's the board. Generally, at the outset, your board members are going to be founders, but as more resource providers come on come on board, they will demand, they sometimes demand board seats. The COI might also require certain directors to agree to, agree to certain actions. So just like I said, you might have given your shareholders a right to consent to certain debt levels. Um, the COI might say directors, the investor appointed director has a right to consent to certain actions. So even while you're sitting around your board table looking very equal, you've got your two founders, you've got an independent director maybe who's come on board and you have your investor director. And it all seems very equal until we realize that the investor director actually has a veto over a large number of company actions. So just, again, be careful about what consent rights you're handing out and the practicality of that for your business. Smaller investors sometimes demand board observer seats. This is not, they don't often treat this as an opportunity to just sit in the back and listen. Oftentimes, board observers like to put their, um, of board observers like to put themselves out there, state their opinions, and it almost feels like they are themselves a director. So you want to make sure that your board observers are carefully chosen and carefully managed also. Your board will have meetings. Those meetings should be fairly regular. I think quarterly is a great option. Um, and you should be preparing for those meetings by creating a slide deck of the things that you want to talk about in that meeting. And also, if there are any particular actions which you expect the board of directors to act on at that point, you can already provide them with resolutions that fit that particular action. So, for example, if we're going to do grants to service providers, you, we can already circulate those resolutions so that your directors have seen them before. It looks really professional to investors when you are set up and you say, okay, here's the deck for the meeting. We're going to discuss this point, this point, and this point. We're going to make these grants, and here are the resolutions for your review prior to making those grants. Drafting minutes is actually something which, which seems really intuitive and easy to do and, and actually really isn't because there is a there is a very delicate balance that you want to make when you are drafting minutes you want to say enough that people know who are reading these minutes that you made a considered decision on whatever it was the value of your stock price whether or not you're going to enter into a certain fundamental key contract but you don't want to say too much because your board minutes will generally be open to, for example, people who are going to invest in your business in the future. So writing down every single person's opinion verbatim is a bad idea. What I have, I'm happy to share with you, um, is I kind of um, created a fake board um, and wrote some fake minutes for you to really see how we write minutes 
for our clients. Generally, I sit in my clients' board meetings as a value added service to my clients, just because firstly, I'm fascinated by everything that they do. It's, it, to me, it, it's just fascinating to see their development, and hear their stories. Secondly, it helps me understand what's coming next for them so that I know what's kind of on the horizon. I don't want to be caught out with them calling me, telling me we just secured $17 million in fundraising. You know, I, I, I want to know that with some runtime. Um, and also it means that I can draft the minutes for them, which at the end of the day makes my life a little bit easier down the line. So please feel free to reach out to me after this. Um, after this meeting, and I can shoot that over to you. Written consent also play a role here. Um, and as I said before, that role is going to be the is going to be just being able to sign off, being able to sign off on things before they get to before you have to call a meeting. Just with shareholders, there are certain actions that must be approved by the board. Major transactions, financing, acquisitions, sales, major in licenses, major out licenses, selection of key vendors such as suppliers for clinical trials, grants to service providers. Your board must sign off on every grant to your service provider. I know that people think that this is comp, that they think that it is compensation, and they think that the CEO, because he has, because the CEO has the right to say, I'm going to pay you. $100,000 a year, we just kind of roll it in. We think, ah, oh, the CEO says, oh, I'm going to give you 100000 a year and also 2%, a 2% equity grant. You can't do that 2% equity without the board's involvement. It is key, absolutely key. And if it's the only thing that you walk away with today, just remember that every time that you decide that you are going to grant an ownership interest in your business, however small, think about who needs to consent to that. Appointment and replacement of officers is also an action which is going to go through the board. Also consider conflicts of interest. So compensation to the CEO and the CEO might sit on the board. He's deciding on his own comp. It's a conflict of interest. So you need to work out how you're going to manage those things. Um, a director is in an investor director, that investor may want to reinvest. Now they have a conflict of interest in the next funding round. Officers are pretty simple, to be honest with you. CEO, president, there's a lot of different names for them and the descriptions are set out in the bylaws. One person can hold more than one of these positions at a time. And as I said before, they act within authority. There's express authority and then there is implied authority. Express authority is the board saying to them, you have the right to, to sign contracts up to this certain amount. Implied authority is what someone outside the business would usually expect the CEO to be able to do. And generally, you should think that your CEO has both express and implied authority. They're usually considered key employees. They're subject, therefore, they might be subject to non-competes if your investor wants to put those in. They usually also get equity compensation. By that, I mean that they are issued stock that vests. Again, what can't you do? You cannot give your officer stock without passing it through your board of directors first. So let's talk about this concept of resource providers. Resource providers are generally people who are going to get, whose ownership, amount and type of ownership is determined by the value of the resources that they are providing to your business. Founders, service providers, IP providers might get an ownership interest and financial supporters, whether that be personal funds, whether that be your family or friends and obviously investors. There are two types. There are really two types of, of kind of these transactions of paths to corporate ownership. The first is dilutive, i.e. every time you give someone an interest in your business, you are diluting people who already have ownership in your business. A grant of common shares is going to be dilutive. A convertible note is not initially dilutive, but will be when it converts. A safe, simple agreement for future equity. Um, this is a very simple way of people investing in businesses without having to kind of do extremely, uh, do much longer documents. Again, it's dilutive. A sale of any sale of shares by the corporation, which is 
usually in connection with a financing round, will be diluted. And equity incentives that you are granting to your employees are going to be dilutive. Non-dilutive is going to be when one shareholder sells their shares to another shareholder and the greatest they will be exiting the business. What's an equity incentive? An equity incentive, as I said, is you are giving someone 2%, 3% in your business um, and it creates an incentive. You are incentivizing your key service providers by giving them the ability to earn a stake in your business. And that is usually conditioned on length of service or the achievement of certain milestones. What it clearly does is it aligns the interests of your employees and the business. Both of them want to achieve the same thing because as a shareholder, they're going to benefit from the increased value of the business that's caused by their service. Vesting. Vesting is not a piece of clothing. Vesting is the grant. It means that the grant of equity, either in the form of restricted stock or options, will be forfeited if certain conditions are not satisfied. So you will vest into a 5% interest in the business. But if you leave before that, before whatever date I've said, if you leave before a year and those interests do not vest, they are unvested, forfeited, and come back to the company. That is the concept of vesting. This is my biohazard, right? I don't want you to take this really seriously, that all of your grants need to be authorized and evidenced. Granting equity is a really fundamental corporate transaction, and it needs to be properly authorized and documented in order for it to be effective. And not only is it important for your business, it's incredibly important for tax purposes. The tax code applies to grants of restrictive stock and options, all of those grants to your employees. If you do not make these grants in accordance with really specific provisions of the tax code, the corporation can cause serious tax consequences to its service providers, to the person that you're trying to do a favor to, where the penalties can even exceed the benefits of the grant let alone what tax they have to pay on it. The penalties could mean that they end up paying more than you even granted them. So I wanna make it really clear that you must consult with competent counsel before you even start about talking, start talking about granting equity incentives to your service provider. This is not something which you can legal zoom. It is also not something that your, your what I call high street, um, your, your main street attorney who generally handles real estate conveyances, small real estate conveyances, um, wills and trusts also will know how to do. I've seen some really, really bad equity comp documents in my time. They are unbelievably expensive to clean up. So either spend the money now or spend it later and you will end up spending much more later to clean, the, clean it up. I want to talk quickly about IP and I'm going to kind of run this, run through this pretty quickly, but given that it is the core of your business, I wanted to touch on it. Obviously, there's two primary ways in which you first get IP into your business. The first is going to be an initial assignment by the founders. You usually do that through an IP assignment agreement. And then there's going to be ongoing assignment by your service providers. So your employees should be signing peers, proprietary information and invention assignment agreements. Your independent contractors should have invention assignments built into their agreements. Those assignments have to have specific language. If you do not have good forms, your attorney should be giving you those forms. Obviously also, in terms of IP, you'll have out licenses where you're licensing your IP out to other people. You'll have in licenses where you bring IP in and you could have joint or co-development agreements where you share IP together. What is really important is understand. And I have to say that with these three, it's generally been my experience that there's going to be attorneys involved in this situation. What you want to focus on and what you want to have a good dialogue with your attorney about is what are the buckets that you're creating? Where, who gets what IP? Do you have, do you, who gets the arising IP? How is the arising IP, i.e. I, the IP that is produced out of this relationship, how, how is that divvied up? 
do you get to keep your initial IP or are we taking our initial IP and, you know, sharing it and now it's everyone's? Understanding what buckets have been created and where, where each bucket ends up going is kind of that key mechanism that you should be talking about with the attorneys who are involved. Great IP hygiene is really important. NDAs, knowing what to share and when to share it. NDA stands for non-disclosure agreements. Having great protection strategies for your IP. This could be filing patents, for example. Making sure that you stay within the scope of your license. So if you've in-licensed things and it's in-licensed for a particular purpose, make sure you stay within it. Lastly, keep an organized bench. Okay, just know whose IP belongs to who, especially when you have in-licensed. Because if you don't, it's a bit of a disaster. You could have infringement claims. It could stop your development or delay your development. You're going to burn a relationship with a key, possibly a key supplier. And it's hard to get out of that situation once you've got into it. So I have three minutes left before I want to open it up to questions and maybe uh, review some other ideas. So I have my top five healthy corporate practices. I like when you when you go to your doctor and he says, when I go to you, when I go to my doctor and I and he says, you know, are you eating? How much chocolate are you really eating, Helen? Let's eat healthy. So this is me telling the doctors in the room, healthy corporate practices. Number one, cap table management. As I said before, there's absolutely nothing wrong with a really great solid Excel spreadsheet. But as soon as you get a little bit further, those programs like Carter are fantastic. You're going to spend a little bit of money, but it's going to be a lot less heartache for you. Secondly, build a data room. This is not hard. Everyone now knows how to use, for example, Google Docs, or you can buy yourself a box account. And that is where you're going to put all of your key corporate documents. So you're going to put a copy of your COI in your data room. You are going to put a copy of every employment agreement that you enter into, every offer letter that you have in your data room. You are going to put a copy of um, every grant that you make into your data room. By putting things into the data room, you will also remember to get things signed and put the executed version into your data room. You will remember, you'll be looking at your dates. Joan's laughing. She has, Joan, you have no idea the number of times I see things that aren't signed. And I'm like, where's the signed version? Like, I, have, I don't know, you know, right? It's really easy when you have a data room just to know, okay, oh, something's meant to go in that folder. I also have a really good form of data room, so I'm happy to screenshot one of my data rooms for you so that you can kind of see how I set data rooms up. Hire good counsel. I recommend that you hire counsel that does have a life sciences focus in their practice. Um, you don't need to be hiring, you know, like the, the biggest and the best firm in, in North America, but you do need someone who understands the quirks of life sciences and is willing to support you throughout your life cycle, as opposed to hiring someone just to start you up, then hiring someone just to write your contracts, and then hiring someone just to sell you. If you can find someone who's willing to support you throughout your life cycle or a firm that has those capabilities, that's what I would recommend. Also, find an attorney that has the ability to scale, who understands that on day one of your business, you cannot be paying him or her for huge amounts of complicated advice and understands on day one, this is what you need and I'm gonna do what you need. But on day 1000, when you're just about to do an exit transaction, now I've scaled up my advice. So find, find a firm that, it, that knows how to scale their services to be appropriate to where you are in your development. Also, when you're looking for good counsel, ask what are your value adds? What else are you going to give me that you're not going to bill me for? So for example, I think some that some really great value adds right now are free attendance at board, at board meetings. I, I don't understand how someone can be a life sciences company's attorney and not want to be at their board meetings. That is just a basic form of understanding your client and being able to add value. Um, also, there are quite a few firms now that have investor services. Perkins is one of them, where we have specialists 
who are not attorneys, who are essentially at straight out of venture capital, the, the venture capital world, who have connections and who can make introductions, who have worked with that I know, investor that you are currently courting and can tell you this is what this person likes to see, or this is their process. Next one, practice good IP hygiene, have great forms and religiously apply them. Don't try and contract on the fly through emails. Really say, okay, this is the way that we do it. We're really serious about it because we want everyone to have complete clarity about what they are doing and what they are getting out of a relationship with us. Mm -hmm. My last one is have great forms and learn how to use them. In general, you should have NDAs, a mutual and a one way. You should have forms that cover employment, whether that be offer letters or employment agreements. And those should be forms where you can fill in the names, have a good scientific advisory board form and have a good independent contractor form for your consultants. These are things that your law firm should be offering you and you should not have to pay your law firm every single time that you want to sign an NDA. Ask your law firm to teach you how to fill in these forms. Say to them, okay, where does the name of the other side go? Where does the business purpose go? Anything else I need to fill in. That way you can start to be independent and develop your own and, and be able to contract without having to call your attorney every time and without having to them to bill you like a point two to write something that honestly you can probably write yourself. So if you can keep to these five really healthy corporate practices, it means that when you come along to a large transaction, when you are ready to do a seed round, for example, you've got a data room, you've got great counsel who already know your business, you can show the investor who the owners are right now, you have a good chain of title for your IP hygiene, and no one is worried that there's someone out there who's left the business with a key idea. And lastly, you when, when they look at your forms, they can see, oh, they use the same NDA every time. Oh, they use the same stab agreement every time. I only need to look at one of them. It makes the whole thing so much easier and cheaper. I want to see you spending your money on the stuff that matters, which is making people's lives better. I honestly would rather that you didn't spend as much money as you could with me. I want to see you changing people's lives. So making sure that you have these healthy corporate practices, I think is a really good first step. So with that, I wanted to open it up to kind of some questions here. So I have one, what if a shareholder dies? Would their beneficiaries get the shares? Is that worked into the controlling documents? Yes, often it is worked into the controlling documents. Um, sometimes you have, sometimes you have scenarios where if a, if a person dies, um, that their shares will automatically be bought back by the company at fair market value. Um, oftentimes what we'll do in order to kind of minimize the pinch in that respect is that we will say the company will buy back your shares at fair market value over a period of five years um, with, with these kind of notes at this rate, for example. And that kind of deals with the pinch of it. But yeah, in general, your beneficiaries the beneficiaries will, will get those shares. So it's important to think about how often do startups keep only to common stock issues? I mean, if, if you have investors coming in, then it, let, me, let me put it a different way. It depends who your resource providers are. Investors are always going to come in and almost always going to ask for preferred stock because that's how they get their preferences. Their, I want this return on, on, on things. I, I want these protections. Um, so if you, if you don't need that kind of investment from venture capital, then yeah you can keep to issuing common stock. The reason why people issue preferred stock is that they have to incentivize someone further to invest in their business. So preferred, it 
is in and of itself an investment that you offer in order to make investing in your business more attractive. If you don't need to do that, because, for example, you are operating purely on non-dilutive grants, a, a grant is not going to dilute your equity, um, then, yeah, you can keep to common stock. Any other questions? People silent. Joan, did you have anything you thought about that you'd like me to kind of recover? I'm just looking back to see whether I, like what I... You no, know, I think you got the ones that are in the chat. The um, So first of all, I wanted to thank you because I really appreciate you giving me control of your company. No, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I wish that I can say that I've never seen a, a small company do that, but I've seen that mistake before. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we're really, really appreciative, Helen, of, of that, um, you know, real down-to-earth explanation of things that we all take for granted. It's, oh, yeah, we know about this, but some of the biggest and most expensive challenges that small companies face as they begin to grow is that they thought they understood. Right, absolutely. I honestly, I, firstly, I, 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 I have a vested interest in seeing the life sciences community here in, here in Arizona grow. Um, if, if you have questions, please, please feel free to reach out to me and ask your questions. If I cannot answer them on a non-billable basis, I will tell you that I can't answer them on a non-billable basis and I will tell you how much it's going to cost. And I generally try and say, you know, I, I can, I generally for my startup say this much, I'm not going to go over this because again, that's scaling. And I think that should be true of other, um, of, of other businesses, um, of other attorneys that, that, never be worried about reaching out for advice because the worst they can say is no i can't give you that advice or send you their their engagement letter but in general i'm i have i'm very generous with with my advice because it's going to help me down the road to see a to see a really well developed thoughtful business here in arizona um, as I said, I have fake business quarterly meetings for you. Um, so please um, find me um, and email me, uh, reach out, um, and I can send those to you. Um, I don't think I can get your messages from the chat, so please send send me an email and ask for them. Um, also, I'm gonna I'll have a I have a screenshot of one of my data rooms. Um, for you to take a look at how things are organized. And you'll understand every file has to have a piece of paper in it. It's like every test tube, right? If you've got a test tube that's empty, what are you missing? Um, so yeah, lastly, I just, Joan, I really just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to do this and to be involved in AZ Bio. You really run a really fantastic program and it's it's been a pleasure getting involved and, and I'm, it's a pleasure being a resource to everyone and also gaining from what AZ Bio offers. So thank you. Well, thank you, Helen. And we truly appreciate Perkins Coy's support. Um, Arizona Bioscience Week is coming up the week of September 25th. And um, last year, we were supposed to be having it live at Perkins Coy's, our, our um, leading women event, and Helen was the moderator. Well, I think, Helen, we're, we're asking for a rain check on that, and um, I hope you'll moderate in person this year. Um, but we truly appreciate your support, the support of the IP team. Um, I, I don't see Tyler on the call this morning, but he and the team have done you know, an amazing job of supporting everyone. So we appreciate your partnership. And we appreciate your willingness to share with our community today. Anyone who needs to contact Helen, um, the easiest way is just um, go, go to the Perkins Coy website and put her last name in, and she will pop up with all of her credentials and her contact information. You can also, of course, reach out to me or to Natalie. So thank you for joining us. We are on the 9 o'clock hour, so we're going to wrap this up. We look forward to seeing you in February for the next edition of AZ Bio Peers. Um, let's go out and build some great companies. Bye, everybody.